When it comes to construction drawings, they are the riskiest element of an architect's practice. At the same time, they're also the most expensive part of your entire contract. So that's why I always recommend a good checklist to make sure you're always on track. What's going on guys? My name is David Tomic and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, firstly, thank you so much for joining me. On this channel, we talk about architecture and technology. Today, I wanted to share my insights as a registered architect in the state of Western Australia on the construction process. I wanted to provide you with my checklist that I use to make sure that I haven't left anything off a construction set of documentation. So what I've done is created a digital checklist with 10 pages and over 200 notes to go through. That means there's all sorts of different information that we're gonna go through step by step to make sure that we don't miss anything off our drawings. The first plan we have a tendency to show is the site plan. The site plan depicts as much as you can possibly see. So the purpose of the site plan is to actually annotate and outline the boundaries. So where is our working space? Where can we actually do the job? When we start to break down the site plan, it's a very simple plan at the essence. It generally shows the position of the building in relation to the site boundaries. So all we're really looking for on the site plan is details about the actual building, the size of the building, the driveways, the landscaping. We're also talking about things like downpipes, stormwater, uh, hydraulic systems, civil engineering, and everything that has to do with the site. So if you're demolishing a bunch of trees, it needs to be noted. If you're adding 60 giant trees, it needs to be noted. Wherever your letterboxes go, wherever your clotheslines go, everything that's outside and needs to be depicted is usually just shown generically on the site plan. Now, after the site plan, we move on to our next page of the checklist. If you're interested, this checklist is available in full to download in the link down below. The next page in the checklist is the floor plan. The floor plan is genuinely about showing details of the actual house itself. Now, this checklist can be used generically for a house or a commercial project. The elements are very similar. We will use a house in this example just for the convenience factor. The floor plan indicates all your internal walls, all your external walls, and everything that you need to know about the inside. So wherever your kitchen cabinetry goes, wherever your sinks are, wherever your showers are, your toilets, and all your plumbing fixtures. And it isn't just physical locations. We wanna be able to detail as much as possible. So every door and window that you see has to be annotated. We wanna start using door and window tags. We also wanna annotate and use wall tags for every single different wall type there is in the construction process. This can be exported out into a completely different plan if you want, but most of the time on simple, smaller jobs, it is shown on the actual floor plan. The floor plan needs to be dimensioned as thoroughly as possible. If somebody's to go build that house, you want them to be able to know exactly where a wall is going or exactly where a unique item in that design has to go. The floor plan has a tendency to be scattered and littered with notes. You wanna be showing things like the room names, the ceiling heights, if there's a raking ceiling or a coffered ceiling or any sort of bulkhead whatsoever. You want to be able to annotate anything on that floor plan that isn't obviously visible. And speaking of not visible, you wanna make sure that you can see all the beams and trusses above as well. So usually it's annotated with a very simple dashed line that indicates there is a beam above and it's noted as well what beam that is. So when somebody begins constructing it, they don't miss a critical element of the process. If it's a much larger building, you might also be using construction grid lines. They usually run one through to nine across the top and A, B, C down the side. Depending on how you actually draw, this might be inverted completely. It doesn't really matter how you do it as long as there is some sort of reference. You can do one through to 100 and one through to 100 on the side and then you just go one and one. It's just an annotative grid to be able to position and locate things. Most of the time, this is spread along column lines so that you know where your column spacing is perfectly from the get-go. Along with everything else that goes on the floor plan, you don't wanna miss any of your elevation or section markers. And you especially don't wanna miss any of your detail markers that come a little bit later on. Now, this is definitely not the time to get lazy and comfortable. Your elevations come next in your working drawing package. Your elevations might seem simple and generic. You're just showing the outside of the building. However, it is very critical that some key elements are shown on the elevation. The elevations depict the architectural expression of that building. So if you have a particular type of cladding that you want on there, you make sure you specify it. You make sure you show every downpipe and where it runs because the last thing you wanna be doing 
is telling a client that unfortunately we have to shift a window across or move an element in that design because the downpipe has absolutely nowhere to go. So things like this are critical on the elevations. There's something that you don't wanna be missing and making mistakes on later down the track. It also gives the builder some key height references. They know exactly where a window needs to go. They know exactly where the doors are, how high they are, how wide they are. It's simple information that is shown on every single elevation, but it is critical to the construction process. Now, most times than not, you can also see the roof structure on an elevation. Sometimes it's a hidden roof and that's okay. You don't have to show it on this. But if it's a generic roof, a hip and valley or a raking roof, then unfortunately you're gonna have to show the pitch on that elevation as well. Because if you go ahead and just draw a single pitch roof with a five degree slope and don't tell the builder that information, how are they gonna build it? They need to know exactly what pitch that roof needs to go to be able to build it exactly how you envisioned. And you remember those grid lines we were talking about a second ago? Those grid lines need to be shown on the elevation as well. So don't forget that your grid lines have to be seen on elevation, floor plan, and also section. Sections are where this project gets really critical. This checklist here in my hand is designed to help you get through these sections and not forget the little details. Sections at work and drawing stage or the construction stage are all about details. It's all about the construction and buildability of that section you're drawing. You wanna pick section lines that are important to the project. You don't wanna be cutting through one robe and leaving it at that. You wanna be cutting things like stairs, bathrooms, where there's set downs, where there's a raking ceiling or a feature ceiling. You wanna be showing as much detail in one single section as you possibly can. So in section, we show that at about a one to 50 scale, which gives us enough detail to show most of the generics of that building. We go further into sectional details a little bit later on, where they're one to 10 or one to 20, but for the most part, sections show all the information we need. In a section, you have to outline how the floor connects to the ground, how that ground connection then connects to the wall and how that wall connects to the roof. You wanna show how all those internal walls connect to the slab as well. Is there a second floor above you? How's that held up? What's that second floor made of? The sections need to be annotated in great detail. You wanna be pointing to everything structural. So for example, if you have structural beams running across the ceiling, you wanna annotate and note them. You wanna point out what roof cladding you're using, what purlins you're using. Any single structural element needs to be shown here. You also wanna annotate things like set downs in the slab for wet areas. So if you need to set down that slab 40 mil to be able to allow for your tile fall in the wet areas, you need to annotate it, otherwise it won't get built. It's important that we show every single height here as well. Height markers are critical in every single view. We wanna know where the ground floor starts, what reference level that is, where the ceiling starts, where it stops, where the next floor starts, how high each individual stair is if you're cutting through a set of stairs. You really wanna show as much possible detail in this section about the construction process. From an administrative side of things, you don't wanna be forgetting about all your room names. So it's important that when somebody picks up that section and goes, oh yeah, I know exactly where this is, it isn't taking them 20 minutes to figure out where that section cuts through. You also wanna be showing those special grid lines we talked about before, if they are depicted on your project. You need to make sure that all your detail markers are shown for every single detail that you want to actually provide architectural influence on. Otherwise, the builder's just gonna build it however they see fit. Now, one of the last things on this very long section list is control joints. I'm mentioning this one specifically because if you do have two materials joining that need some sort of control joint, well then, it's something that's gonna to have to be shown in section. The next page is the roof plan. If it wasn't galing winds and rain outside right now, I'd go sit on my roof to actually articulate this point a little bit better. But unfortunately, it's pretty miserable. So we're gonna try to use a high up angle to reflect what we could usually see from up top. The roof plan is all about the actual roof structure and what's going on. So we need to annotate our roof covering. We need to show our purlins which direction they're going. We need to showcase all our flashings and our gutters, our downpipes. How big are the downpipes? How wide are they? What color are they? Where do they actually go? We need to showcase the gutters in great detail. Is it a box gutter? Does it need to be 300, 600 wide? This is some information that's always shown on the roof plan and something that shouldn't be forgotten. Similar to how we had to show the pitch on the elevation, we also have to show the pitch on the roof plan. We also wanna show elements like the ridge, any valleys, any hips, if it's a hip and valley roof, or what direction it's actually raking in. 
So just some generic annotations for the roof that needs to be shown on this plan. If it's a much larger job and you're using a mechanical engineer, for example, you also need to depict where their elements need to go. Where's the air conditioning system going? Where's the condensers going? Are you screening that? Where's the platform and how do you get up to that platform to maintain those systems? These are all the details that you have to think of or at least be provided with by the mechanical engineer to showcase on your drawings. Usually if a mechanical engineer is involved, you run out of roof space pretty quickly on a small roof. So what happens if the client wants some solar panels on there? Well, you're gonna to have to make room for those solar panels in the most ideal location, depending on where you are living around the world. Solar panels take up a decent amount of space and can take up the whole roof if they want to. They can actually form part of the roof. So if they do form part of the roof, like for example, a Tesla solar roof, then that's something you wanna annotate and outline straight away on this plan because it's a critical element to the design. If your structural engineer, for example, doesn't know that there needs to be solar panels on the roof, well, they could go ahead and design standard purlins and standard beams that can't support the weight of those solar panels. And if they can't support the weight of the solar panels, they definitely can't support the weight of any mechanical systems. So these two elements need to inform the structural engineer's decision on what purlin sizes, what beam sizes, or what truss sizes they use to be able to support the weight. It's not as simple as just chucking some solar panels on the roof and hoping for the best. Housekeeping, like always, you need to show those grid lines, you need to show those section markers, you need to show those elevation markers. You wanna showcase everything that you've shown on all the other floor plans. Your electrical plan comes next. The last thing you wanna be doing is moving in and having no electrical in that house. So if your client comes in and can't plug in their fridge, they're gonna be pretty upset. What we show on the electrical plan comes down to what the client actually wants. The basics are obvious. We have all of our lighting, be it pendants, hanging lights, down lights, recess lights, whatever. We have to show where those light switches go. Are they dimmable? Are they two-way switches? What kind of lights are they actually? Then we wanna go into details such as PowerPoints. How high up are they? Where are they located? How many of them are? Usually with PowerPoints in studies especially, there's also data and phone lines and things like that to consider. If it's an old school place or even a potential business, fax lines are important as well. It's not that simple. We also have to show all of our mechanical surfaces, all of our PowerPoints for those mechanical surfaces, all the vents, all the manholes, all the hot water units outside. Do we have a pool outside? Do we have a pump that needs to be required? Do we have a spa outside? Anything that requires some sort of electrical service needs to be detailed and showcased as much as possible on the electrical plan. The electrical plan is a very clean, simple, minimalistic version of the floor plan that has all the same annotations, the same markers, elevation markers, section markers, grid lines, etc. But it's just showcasing our electrical items. And now because you have 101 electrical items on that floor plan, don't forget the legend as well. Now it's time to showcase a little bit more detail in the actual rooms that require knowledge. Your room layouts become critical to understand where elements in your kitchen and your bathroom need to go. Sometimes you do need to show internal room layouts for specific items like some cabinetry or a shelf or anything of those sorts of works that requires attention to detail. Some people do them in robes as well if it is a detailed robe. However, if it's just shelves evenly spaced, you don't need to do them. With an internal room layout, it's all about details. So for example, you want to make sure you know exactly where your dishwasher is going in a kitchen. You want to know how high that little kickboard is. You want to know how high the bench top is. You want to know how thick the bench top is. Is there some overhead cupboards? How high up are those overhead cupboards? Is there a bulkhead as well? These are all the details that we have to showcase on the internal room layouts. If there's some electrical features as well that are simply features more so than anything else, like LED strip lighting, that's something you want to consider adding into an internal room layout so people know exactly where it's going. You want to showcase as much detail on the internal room layouts as possible. So if you have a sink, you want to showcase what style of sink it is, what kind of mixer it is. Is it a hot and cold tap or is it a mixer tap? People are going to get confused very quickly on site. If they see a mixer tap on the drawing, they're going to be flicking through the actual specifications to find a mixer tap. So I know it seems petty and I know it seems like little details, especially if you have 150 pages of specifications, but you need to show accurate information on the drawings on internal room layout. If you're showing internal room layouts of the bathroom, for example, make sure you don't forget about handrails, toilet rails, or anything that has to be fixed to the wall. Now this might seem like an obvious one, but you need to showcase a door and window schedule. Doors and windows are often forgotten about 
or they're completely done incorrectly. The door and window schedule needs to accurately reflect every detail that you've put on every other page. So if you've dimensioned the windows and the doors on your floor plan, the overall size needs to be exactly the same. If you put height markers on your elevation, the overall height needs to be exactly the same. The sill height needs to be exactly the same. If it's inconsistent in any way, shape or form, somebody's gonna be giving you a call and asking what is going on, where does it actually go? Now I know there's a lot of information in this video, especially for somebody to remember and write down. So if you do wanna download this checklist, it's just in the link below. I'll make sure it's the first one to make it easy for you guys. With the door and window schedule, it's a visual representation of every single door and window. You wanna show a picture of that door and window at the top, and then you'll start listing some items below. You wanna have those window tags so you know exactly what window you're looking at. You wanna know how many of those windows or doors you need. You wanna know which way they swing or which way they open. You wanna know what type of frame material they are, what kind of color they are. Do they need a fly screen? Do they not? What kind of hardware's on there? Do you have a simple lock and key? What kind of key is it? Are they all keyed alike? It's very simple details that can be obviously discussed during the project but it's something that you wanna take control of at the start, especially if you're dealing with energy efficiency homes. So for example, in Australia, we only use single glazing. That's gonna rapidly change in the next couple of months where we're gonna to go to double glazing as a standard. So you're gonna to have to start noting double glazing as a standard in all drawings to make sure that nobody stuffs up and cheaps out and goes put some single glazing in, completely ruining the energy efficiency rating of that house. Okay, so we're on the second last page of this checklist now. And this is one of the most critical elements of the construction process. We're talking about construction details here. The construction details are usually used to depict architectural details as well as structural details themselves. So for example, if we're having a connection detail where a windowsill meets a wall frame and you wanna annotate exactly how that windowsill needs to be finished, then you have to annotate it and depict it in exactly the manner you want it to be built. So if it's just a simple recess sill, it might be that easy, but you wanna blow it up to a one in 20 scale, maybe a one in 10 scale if it's quite small and list every single item there is there. You wanna literally list everything. So if you have what type of glazing it is, what type of frame it is, what type of cladding's on the outside, how the trim is, how it's flashed, how it's sealed, is there any waterproofing there? What about silicon? You also need to think internally as well as externally. So what kind of plasterboards on the inside? What color paint is on the inside? Is there a corner seen in that detail? What about a skirting? Every single literal detail that you would see if you went on that house and somehow magically just cut out that one little section, you need to be able to annotate. The same works with the floor plan details. If there's a connection plate on the floor plan that you need to showcase, show it in as much detail as possible. Because if you don't show the detail, it's gonna get built however the builder wants. And usually it's the cheapest, nastiest method. The last page on the checklist is your consultants. So these consultants are potentially necessary, potentially not necessary. There is a number of consultants on here for a diverse range of jobs. A total of 20 consultants is found at the bottom of the list. I've made a video about this previously talking about all the consultants, but I wanted to add it at the end of the checklist just to make sure that you know you might need some of these consultants at the very start of a project or at the very end. It's more so a memory trigger or a guide for you guys to be able to just look back at this and go, ooh, architect, yeah, definitely have one of those, that's me. Ooh, mechanical, yep, I've got him sorted. So it's more so just a reminder than anything else. Anyway, that's all for me today, guys. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the construction checklist and I hope you got some good information out of it. If you did, it's the first link in the description down below if you wanna download it. If you enjoyed this type of content, make sure you smash that subscribe button down below. And because this video forms one of my 28 videos in 28 days, it would usually be, I'll see you next Monday. But in this case, I'll see you tomorrow.